Hello, my name is Jean Dwyer and I'm the Director of Resource and Learning at Our Lady of Mercy School in Potomac, Maryland. Today's presentation will be on assistive technology, building capacity to access and learning for all. We're gonna set this webinar up and um, by scanning the objective, the webinar objectives on our next slide, I want you to examine your thoughts about the provision of assistive technology devices and or services for effectively universally designed instruction during this presentation. And I want you to take a challenge question. And here it is. How does the integration of AT or assistive technology and UDL, Universal Design for Learning, for all students, particularly those with diverse learning challenges, impact instruction and outcome for students? So think about that challenge question as we go through this presentation and I'll revisit it at the end of the webinar. Here are three objectives for today's presentation. I want you to help um, or learn about identifying the elements of effective assistive technology in universally designed instruction for students with disabilities. We're going to effectively integrate AT into UDL across all environments within our Catholic schools. And we're gonna access resources to support the integration of AT into UDL for children receiving education services through an individualized Catholic education plan or a Catholic accommodation plan. So we'll begin with our presentation. We know that um, through IDEA, assistive technology devices and or services are something that needs to be considered on an annual basis. And it is defined in two ways. One, assistive te technology devices includes any item, piece of equipment, product system used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capability of a child with a disability. There is a second piece to the law that also provides greater access, which is AT services. So as the device is considered on an annual basis, they also have to think about the service that goes along with the device, which is, helps with the selection, acquisition, maintenance, and training in the use of the assistive technology. AT must be considered for every child with a disability annually. This usually only takes a few minutes in the consideration of AT in the annual consideration during an ICEP or an IEP. This is federal le legislation and federal legislation is something that I know Catholic schools wanna be in alignment with and very important that we make sure that we are aware of what the federal law says about the integration and consideration of assistive technology. So how can AT help? There are many broad categories around assistive technology and here are just a few. Most assistive technology would fit within each one of these. And so this kind of gives you a, um, a category or a way of thinking about assistive technology and how it might be helpful for a student within your classroom. And they are reading, written expression, math, communication, recreation, daily organization, seating and positioning, hearing, seeing, self-care, mobility, and other aids. So when we look at assistive technology, we do look at the continuum of AT devices. And here it is anything from low tech, medium tech to high tech. Low tech are those things that usually are intuitive, require little um, training, usually are not even battery operated or electrical in any way and are very quite easy to use and integrate within the curriculum or into your lesson plans. Medium tech te devices are sometimes referred to as light tech. They might require some training, usually are power um, by batteries or battery operated and, um, and are easily used. Then you go up the continuum, it is high tech. 
high-tech assistive technology devices are more complex in nature. They do require training. They usually are of a dig digital nature and usually require electronics to, to operate it. Here are some examples of low-tech AT devices. One might be a, a check-in chart that many of our students use at Our Lady of Mercy, graphic organizers, which are a part of many, many of our classrooms. We might use something like a slant board to support writing or a bouncy band for those students who have some difficulty sitting in chairs or maintaining attention. They use these bouncy bands as something that is very, very helpful. We also have a lot of fidgets. Fidgets help with maintaining attention, maybe avoiding an unneeded or unnecessary behavior. We have many adapted pencils and pens, post-its, highlighters. All of these are low-tech devices, assistive technology tools that could be used across your curriculum. Some of the low-tech devices at Our Lady of Mercy, and what does it look like? We use a wonderful program called Handwriting Without Tears, which has these little, little chalkboards. So we use chalk, we use adapted pencils, we use um, pencil grips. Then we have also children using our slant boards. And um, they have found this to be very, very helpful. Moving on to me medium tech devices. Medium tech usually has a simple electronic feature and they require some training for both teachers and families. Um, a couple of examples of these are a scanning pen which has the, the capability of reading a word aloud and then defining that word. We use closed captioning, closed captioning with many of our online digital formats, not only for those students who might have some visual um, impairment, but for those students that it actually just helps them maintain attention. And then augmentative communication devices. These are some examples of medium tech they have a battery, they are not that difficult to use, and some training is required. What does medium tech devices look like at Our Lady of Mercy? Some of our students use a scanning or a reading pen made by C-Pen. This allows the student to just read along in the classroom or in the learning center. And as they come upon a word or a phrase or a sentence that they can't read, they simply scan that, that sentence. It re reads aloud to them. It could be read aloud, or you could just have it read aloud with using earbuds or earphones. It also will define the word. We also use augmentative communication devices. Right now we're using a GoTalk and our students use that to help with their alternative communication. Some high-tech devices can be high-tech devices are those devices that are usually require a bit more training, a little bit more complex in its nature. And also it has um, an electronic or um, power source that it's required to use. Um, here we use iPads. There's a wonderful, um, there's a wonderful resource that we use, which is called the iPad Apps Learning for learners with dyslexia and reading um, and writing difficulties. And this is a wonderful way to really look at some possible needs that your students might have as it relates to reading and writing, and then drill down to specific apps that you would use, that we use on our iPads to help those students. So that's a wonderful resource that we provide to our educators and our teachers families to make sure that there are specific apps that would help them to overcome any barriers that they might be experiencing. Equasio is a wonderful tool. It is a um, math tool that helps to uh, support students who might have challenges with math, wonderful features that have um, text-to-speech and other features that make the uh, math come alive and have a lot of graphics. Then we use Read and Write. Read and Write is also made by TextHelp. That is a tool with text-to-speech 
and speech to text, word processing and word prediction, other study skills tools that help the student to um, provide a greater access. Here at um, Our Lady of Mercy, some of the examples of high tech that we have been using is Equation. You see a student using here. They, this student has a goal of really learning between big and small and different sizes and shapes. We created many lesson plans on Equation to teach that, and that's one of his learning um, centers within this classroom. We have an older student, an eighth grade student, who's using text-to-speech and word prediction in text help. And that is um, pushed across the network on all our Chromebooks. So these students can have access to that device. So what is the continuum of, of assistive technology? I know that many, many people might not have that knowledge of assistive technology. And so how do we make sure that the knowledge of assistive technology that might reside with an expert or the special educator or the resource teacher at your school, how do we make sure that that is available to everybody? How do we make sure that they consider assistive technology and know about assistive technology for those functional need areas that we spoke of earlier? Here are only two resources. There are so many that you can look into. Just Google the continuum of assistive technology and you'll get, up, you'll get many, many resources. But two widely used nationwide is what's called the assistive technology wield. It is produced by CAST. CAST is up in Boston. It is the Center for Applied Special Ed Technology. This is a wonderful tool developed by Dr. Penny Reed, which is going from low to high tech accommodations under any functional need area. So it would look at reading, writing, mobility, positioning, any functional need area, and then give some possible or potential tools that might help for that area. Then the GPAC guide, which is the Georgia Project Assistive Technology Guide. This is a very comprehensive guide that really walks you through that same continuum from low to high tech of those different functional need areas and what might be accessible, not only as an instructional tool already in, available in your classroom, but then what are some potential assistive technology tools that you might wanna consider. These are really useful as you look at the consideration and implementation of assistive technology. So prior to working at Our Lady of Mercy School, I actually worked at Johns Hopkins University at the School of Education. And we worked in partnership with the Maryland State Department of Education to look at, um, and many school districts across Maryland, to look at the implementation of assistive technology and whether or not it was being used. And we found that both general and special educators and related service providers were really struggling with how to look at and consider assistive technology, but also choose and trial, implement and monitor assistive technology. And so we built this JHU AT cycle to help education teams to carefully consider if a student needs assistive technology and how this cycle would help educators and students to help their students access the general ed curriculum. So we just put it into a cycle of four um, um, stages that you would consider assistive technology, how to choose and trial AT, how to implement it, and then how to monitor it for its effectiveness and whether or not it gave greater access to the student. There are many guides on the Maryland Learning Links um, website that walks you through this JHUT cycle and whether or not it would be useful for the students that you work with. So in the first phase of considering assistive technology is the consideration that what that is what the law requires. Federal legislation says that it must be considered every single year in an, I, in an IEP. Even within the Catholic schools, we wanna make sure that we are in alignment with federal legislation. So as we start to develop our ICEPs and our CAP forms, 
that we do look at whether or not assistive technology would, gain, would gain greater access to the curriculum for those students with disabilities. And so a way to do that, and something that we have used across Maryland and within Our Lady of Mercy School, is a research developed tool called the SET Framework developed by Dr. Joy Zabala. And this really is an acronym for Student Environment Tasks and Tools. It really is a comprehensive framework for considering and implementing AT. It does promote that collaborative decision-making in all phases of AT. And what I mean by that, it's not just done by the resource teacher or by the principal or by someone who knows about assistive technology. It really is a collaborative tool that helps all educators who will be having that student in their classroom with a diverse learning need to look at assistive technology and how assistive technology might get over a barrier that they're facing. This is what SET stands for. I'm gonna move myself down there. SET really is for the student environment tasks and tools. And this tool, you could go on to um, set.com and you'll find it or joyzabala.com and you will find all the guides on how to consider assistive technology and use this set framework. But this planning guide is wonderful because it has these simple guiding questions for education teams that we have used at Our Lady of Mercy to really guide our thinking about how we might look at some possible solutions for students who are facing many, many barriers. So you're gonna look at the student, you're gonna ask a few simple questions. What are the student's current abilities? What are their, some of their special needs? And what are their functional areas of concern, like speaking or writing? Then we're gonna look at the environment. What activities take place in that environment? What activities do other children do in that environment that this child cannot participate in? And what assistive technology does the child access or currently use? Then we're gonna look at those tasks within each one of those environments, what activities are expected in the general education curriculum and environment, and then what would success look like if you could successfully complete those tasks? And the last one is tools, because all the information before that, the student, the environment, and the task leads up to some possible potential tools that you might start to try and see if they're successful. See if they, they add to the, um, the access that you're looking for for that student. You're gonna look at those tools from anything from low to high tech, and you wanna make sure that um, it is student-centered and task-oriented, and that the training requirements are provided for both the student, the family, and the staff. I love the elements of the SET framework because it is so collaborative in nature. It really takes it away from that expert model into the school environment, particularly into the classrooms to make sure that across all our Catholic schools, assistive technology is being used by all teachers because they were part of the process. They were part of that initial discussion on the tools that might give greater access to the tasks that they're required to do. It's also a collaborative and that in this decision-making process, it's critical to gain the buy-in for all teachers that you're just not going in there, giving them a device and saying, use this. No, they were part of that initial conversation. It also really encourages this multiple perspective that every real, everybody on the, uh, on the ISEP team has different knowledge and set of skills and experience and ideas that are brought to the table to help with the consideration of assistive technology. And then it's an ongoing process. It's not scary. I often get that question, you know, I don't know whether or not to try a certain device. It's ongoing. We're going to try some different things to see if the student likes it, to see if it's getting to those tasks that we want to do, to see if we can use it in all the environments. Is it available in the gym, the lunchroom, the classroom? Um, and you could, at any point in time, you can then go back and adjust as, as needed. So 
So as we start to look at, now we've looked at assistive technology overall, and now we're gonna start to look at, as we develop an ICEP or a CAP plan, how do we really start to integrate these systems of tools into that process? So we know that as do we develop a standardized IEP, some federal law dictates that we look under special considerations and accommodations and that we consider assistive technology on an annual basis. We wanna do the same thing in our ICEPs and our Catholic accommodation plans. We wanna consider annually for all children with a disability during the development of an ICEP. We want everybody at the table who's gonna be working with that student to help to develop an ICEP or a CAP plan so we are in alignment with federal legislation. We want the education teams to consider AT devices and or services separately because sometimes the device comes along and they just are using the device and they don't need an assistive technology service. They've already been using text-to-speech for years. They won't need any service to go along with that. And we also want to always say that assistive technology is not a related service. It's not as if it's speech therapy or physical therapy. It really is something that should be integrated within the universally designed curriculum that we hopefully are designing. So as part of my work at Johns Hopkins University, I had the great opportunity of working with our Maryland online IEP system. And we were finding that educators across Maryland really didn't know how to consider assistive technology and were struggling with that. And so we wanted to change our documentation piece in providing a little bit more description around considering assistive technology, devices and or services for our students with disabilities. We wanted to make sure that assistive technology was at the forefront of their mind as they thought about developing an IEP and um, how to start that. And so we developed four outcomes or decisions that the ICEP teams and IEP teams will look at when they look at assistive technology. And one of the decisions is the student does not require AT device or AT service. They've considered it. The student has no barriers to the curriculum. Everything that they are, they are progressing in the curriculum. There's no need for a device or a service. The second outcome could be the student does not require AT device, but does require an AT service. Hmm. In this circumstance, it might be something that you might want to collect a little bit more data. You're not quite sure if the student needs an AT device. So we're gonna start off with the AT service because that would gather the data that we need to determine whether or not a device is needed or not. Then the student requires an AT device and requires an AT service. This usually happens with um, students who have been using, let's say an alternative augmentative communication, communication device or a writing processing tool that the uh, word processing tool that they've been using for many years. The student will continue to use this to make sure that they can get over any barriers in their classroom and access their curriculum. The fourth outcome could be the student requires AT device, but does not require an AT service. This would be somebody who might be using a device for a very long time. They still need the device, but they don't need any training, maintenance, or repair around that device. They just might need that um, device to to continue to use it in, during their school day and in other environments within their life. Then we also provided how two different spaces for documenting your basis for using both the device and the service, including any trials that you're going to be trying to see whether or not that device would be helpful. That is, this is a standard aligned IEP. So in the Archdiocese of Washington, where Our Lady of Mercy is, we have our individual Catholic education plan. And in this education plan, there is a small portion of um, 
assistive technology consideration, which allows the use of other assistive technologies, and then you would specify. Why this is um, semi-helpful, I think that um, having something with a little bit more description might be useful for our students and for our families to consider assistive technology for all our students with disabilities. So you could see that the difference between the two types of um, plans that consider assistive technology. So what do collaborative teams need to do? First of all, we, I think they have to start to understand the AT consideration and the thought process around that. That's why I started off with a law. It's important to know that we want to be in alignment with federal law. We also want to ask guiding questions to understand the student's need for assistive technology. Maybe they've been struggling with the same skill year after year, and the team really hasn't considered assistive technology. That would be very helpful to that student. Then we want to look at how we might integrate assistive technology into the selection of individualized supports and services. And that might be in the documentation piece as we just spoke of in our ICEF and CAP plans. We also might wanna look at additional variables that impact the curriculum accessibility. So are we looking at, is the curriculum really universally designed and is there some flexibility in its implementation? Here we have AT categories, and under our AT categories are something like academics for written expression, reading, math, access, things like what we talked of before, anything from low to high tech, something so simple as a post-it note, an adapted pencil grip, up through text-to-speech and text help and word processing tools and apps on our iPads to help with reading and writing. Then daily organization, you might wanna look at binders and post-its. Alternative augmentative communication or otherwise known as AAC is communication boards, AAC devices, listening devices. How about looking at our environment? the environmental control, our daily living and vocational aids, our architectural modifications, and our recreational technologies. And then for sensory, for hearing and vision, it might be hearing aids or closed caption TV, visual aids like magnifying devices, and then sensory aids, weighted blankets and fidgets. These are all the AT categories and some examples of how um, assistive technology might provide greater access. So to accelerate the students' learning, we will look at some of the continuum of devices, anything from low tech, medium tech through high tech. So for example, let's take a handwriting difficulty. It would be a pencil or paper grip, a pencil or pen grip up through recorded answers. And then if no independence or success or portable word processor or computer with a specialized software such as text-to-speech. So you would go from something as low tech up through something more high tech. I would say that if the low tech device doesn't meet the student's needs, the school is not obliged to purchase a high tech device. And so if the low tech device does meet the student's need, I, that's great. It is easy to use. It's intuitive. People can use it without a lot of training. Um, and so that is, that is optimal. But that doesn't mean to say that we're not going to go up that continuum if the low tech doesn't work and look at some more, um, look at some more uh, high tech options. We also want to encourage that ICEP teams should explore all options from low to high tech remembering that high tech has requirements for training and maintenance and repair. That shouldn't deter us, but is something that we should keep in mind. So for academics, here are some, here are some wonderful examples of, here are some wonderful examples of assistive technology that could work for a student with a disability, something like adapted, um, and or adaptive paper or accessible books, 
writing tools and grips, um, uh, math manipulatives, text to speech, speech to text and word prediction. In the lower right hand tool is that text help tool that I spoke of earlier, read and write, which is um, on all our devices, Our Lady of Mercy, and that we have found extremely helpful. Under communication, there are picture symbols and picture symbols, just not for communication, but for helping with um, behavior modification and single message devices, mid tech voice output devices and high tech voice output devices and apps. All of these things help you to move from low tech up through high tech as it relates to communication. Then there are sensory aids, tactile toys and fidgets, auditory stimulation, visual stimulation, and then deep pressure and weighted items. Here you'll see some fidgets and some earphones and a wonderful weighted vest that we've found very helpful for some of our students. So we've gone through the code developed stage of the role of assistive technology and universal design for learning. And now we're in the implementation. So we've developed the ICEP and the CAP plan. We're starting now to implement those plans. Who makes up this collaborative team, which we really do want to build greater capacity and inclusive environments. This collaborative team is really made up of the student first because it's for the student that we are trying to provide greater access. We wanna definitely include the parents and family members, administrators or administrators are critical to this piece, the resource teacher, classroom teacher, related service providers, paraeducators, and anyone else that the student believes or the team believes would be very helpful to the situation. We do wanna remember that AT can be delivered by any ICEP team member. The goal is to build the capacities among the providers, educators and students to accelerate the progress. We wanna get it away from that expert model or being used only here, like we have here in the resource center or the learning center, we wanna integrate it into the classroom. What are some of the responsibilities of the collaborative team? Everyone on the collaborative team has something important to contribute to the conversation about assistive technology. If you want assistive technology to be used universally across all your environments, all the collaborative team members have to be a part of that conversation. You have to have equitable roles and responsibilities of the consideration and implementation of AT. And you want to make sure that the, the these collaborative teams are the fabric of the universal design for learning. They're the ones in the classroom who are gonna be implementing this assistive technology. So you wanna make sure that they are a part of the initial conversations. So what do the collaborative teams need to do? I think understand the legal requirements. We wanna make sure that we are in alignment with federal legislation. We wanna know what AT is about and how it benefits our students with disabilities. We wanna ask guiding questions to determine if the AT implementation plan that you might wanna make and the ICEP and the Catholic accommodation plan are implemented with fidelity across all settings. So after you consider assistive technology, you trial it, you implement it, you want to evaluate it. Remember going back to the JHUAT cycle, we want to make sure that that fidelity of assistive technology is done in such a way that it's actually helpful to the student. For us to be universally designed, we want to make sure that we examine our lesson plans to ensure that AT is integrated throughout all instruction. And then we want to observe the student across all the settings to understand the effectiveness of AT and the impact on instruction. So is the student narrowing the gap? Is the student progressing in its curriculum? You could simply develop an implementation plan and some of the things that you might include is a service category, which are the instructional supports, the nature of the service like an AAC device or text-to-speech or something as simple as a pencil grip, the frequency of when that assistive technology will be used, who will be the primary provider, even though we want it across all settings, then other providers, 
such as a resource teacher and additional support staff? And then in what location will it be used? This is just an example of a simple implementation plan that you might wanna think about when we think about assistive technology. So developing an implementation plan, these are some think abouts that I would that I would challenge you with. Does the implementation plan provide information regarding who, what, where, when, and how? Has the location and manner of the um, AT services been clarified? Is there any information missing from the implementation plan? And will the members of your team need training to provide the AT services? We actually found this very critical at our school. We made sure that all the teachers were trained on the assistive technology device. It changed our initial summer training and then throughout the year updates to that training back in the learning center in the classroom to make sure that the teachers were kept abreast on any assistive technology um, trainings that they needed to have to use those tools within their classrooms. How do you document whether or not there these the how do we document um, that the evidence or the observations of assistive technology are being used? It could be an observation document. So I often go into classrooms and take along some observation documents that we've created and make sure that the assistive technology is being used across all settings. And you can also use teacher-based assessment, checklists, and product, quarterly progress reports. This data dis decision-making that you are creating really does help with the um, effectiveness and whether or not, or the monitoring of assistive technology across your classrooms. And so taking the data will inform families and the whole collaborative team on whether or not that assistive technology is being helpful. What does UDL um, with embedded AT look like? I'm gonna take this first example. An iPad with an educational program specifically selected to meet the needs of a student used in all settings with results progress monitored. So it is, it is individually chosen. It is not an iPad with a generic educational program that is provided for all students in the classroom and used during instructional downtime. We know that when implemented effectively within UDL, AT devices and or services are infused into the student's daily curriculum, instruction, and assessment. It's woven throughout all aspects of the student's life, and it's visibly beneficial to the student and leads to positive outcomes. So I, I really want to look at um, assistive technology consideration and service delivery paradigm shift. I want to um, uh, challenge you that we kind of get away from that expert model and start to look at a capacity building model that the AT expert doesn't only do the conduct the AT trials and data collection, that they don't own the AT knowledge, that they don't implement AT strategies with the students and they alone make decisions. I would rather go to a capacity building model where we teach staff to consider assistive technology and um, and how to collect data. Some of the things that we had already previously discussed in our earlier slides. Support staff to own AT knowledge, help the staff to implement it, and then guide the decisions around assistive technology. The rationale for this is that staff needs to be, um, staff needs to implement the AT strategy and not the experts. So I think that would be very helpful as we move forward. At Our Lady of Mercy School, building capacity for all, building capacity for all learners. These are some of the tools that we have at Our Lady of Mercy. Text help, Equasio, Learning Ally, Bookshare, Reading Scanning Pen, Typing Tutors, and Chromebooks. When we evaluate our um, our plans and whether or not assistive technology is being used with fidelity, we want to look at three major questions. Is the student making progress? Are we narrowing gaps? Is the AT implemented with fidelity? We wanna reflect upon these three questions when we monitor assistive technology. 
what are some of the fidelity measures that we look at when we evaluate our um, ISEP plans and our AT plans? If the AT is being implemented with fidelity, we have you will use simple checklists. They could be teacher or pre-made checklists. And we wanna look at these, um, this fidelity at least three times a year. So there's a big paradigm shift, changes both the diocesan school-wide tools, your documents and your procedures. I would like to say that um, our, our, in our, at Our Lady of Mercy, we really are starting to change our school-wide policy and procedures around access and universal design and assistive technology. We have provided greater technical assistance at our own school about making a network, um, a network with assistive technology tools already built in that are pushed across the school. We are making changes to our ISET form to make sure that assistive technology is considered with greater thoughtfulness. And we want to change our manuals and our trainings to make sure that assistive technology is a greater piece of the instruction and training around giving access to students with disabilities. So what are some of the most interesting discoveries you made while listening to today's webinar? And what is one action step that you plan on taking to improve your use of assistive technology with students? So let's go back to our challenge question. How does the integration of AT and UDL for all students, particularly those with diverse learning challenges, impact instruction and outcomes for students? That's something that I'd like you to think about. So as a wrap up, in summary, effective AT is carefully considered, implemented, and evaluated for effectiveness. It's implemented consistently by the, the entire collaborative education team. And remember, AT is important for independence and sex, successful outcomes for students with disabilities. I thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you.